Daniel Bryan, lovely to see you. Welcome back to Gorilla Position. Yeah, thank how, you. How are you? I'm wonderful. Yeah, enjoying the European tour so far? Yes. So, but one of the unexpected <laughs> things of uh, coming back that I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that we would have the 10 day Saudi Arabia trip. Mm. And then we were home for three and a half days, and then now we're on an 18 day European trip. Um, and I didn't realize they were so close together. I miss my baby so much. Well, I was going to ask you. I mean, congratulations yeah. on Birdie. She's a year old already. She's a year old. I missed her first birthday. Oh, my. She said Dada for the first time, which I saw on, on FaceTime, but I did not. I, I still haven't seen, like, in person yet. Yeah. And so, but now when I FaceTime her and Bree, she like, she's like, Dada, Dada. And it's so stinking cute. <laughs> but I, like, I haven't seen it in person. I just see, like, yeah. a screen. But I also, like... I go back and forth and thinking like, okay, oh man, I miss her so much. But then I also think like, hey, we have it better than any generation before us where I can FaceTime my baby and yeah. see her every single day. Yeah. Whereas like people even in 1998 are still for the most part using hotel phones or a pay it's phone crazy, or something like that. Crazy yeah. how much things have changed. So, so yeah. So I I have a mixture of sadness and, and gratitude. Yeah. <laughs> but – um. Being being a dad, you're you're obviously loving it. Bree doing well. You you enjoying the uh, the ride? Yeah. So it's it's really, and it, especially I mean, one we're very lucky because we have a great baby who is happy most of the time, who sleeps through the night most of the time, and like she's at this stage right now that I absolutely love, where she wakes up, she cries because she just wants us yeah. when she wakes up, but then she see, she sleeps in the same room as us. And I always wake up before her. So I'm already awake in bed. And then she cries. And then I sit up. And she's already standing in her crib. And when she sees me sit up, she waves. <laughs> and then, like, I come over and get her. I pick her up. She nuzzles deep into my neck. And then I bring her onto the bed. At that point, Bree wakes up. And she turns on the lamp. And all Bertie does is she just rolls around and just plays. <laughs> and it's just, like... It's the best possible way to start your day. I used to think the best way to start my day was get up, drink a lot of water, mm -hmm. and then do some like morning yoga and stretching. Like, ah, now I feel good. No way, man. This is way better. You weren't living back then. Yeah, I wasn't living. Now yeah, you're yeah, living yeah, a yeah, proper yeah, yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great, man. And great news, obviously, that you're you're back in the ring. What? Talk to me about the, the, the process. Last time we spoke, you were telling me about how so many doctors had cleared you, but mm -hmm. the WWE doctor hadn't. Mm -hmm. How did that position change? Was it just a case of a lot of time passing and things healing? What was the process? No, it was it was mostly okay. So uh, I went and talked to Vince McMahon about like, hey, all these doctors have cleared me, and I understand why your doctor isn't clearing me, but I think I should be cleared, <laughs> and I'm just giving this another chance because my contract is up. And if you guys are completely closed off to me, to me wrestling. That's fine. I just want to know so I can make other plans. Yeah. And uh, and he said, well, what about this? What happens if you get another concussion? And I said, well, because this and this and whatever. And uh, I, I told him I had an idea of a revised concussion protocol that's specific to me, to me only, right? And so he said, okay, well, e email that to Dr. Maroon and see what he says. And uh, I emailed Dr. Maroon and... It's a very well thought out, you know, email. And Dr. Maroon says, thank you for sending this to me. I, re you know, respect the way that you've handled this and all that kind of stuff. I am open to sending you to other doctors. So he sent me to the three neurologists in the United States that he, f that he feels like are the best neurologists yeah. and to get their opinions on it. And then, um, and one of the things I really respect about Dr. Maroon is that he could have easily sent me to somebody who just confirmed his own opinion, right? Like okay, yeah. there are plenty of doctors who would have just said, ah, oh, no, we're, you know, we're not going to clear you. But he sent me to the guys that he thought were the best. The guy who's the neurologist for the uh, Winter Olympic team for the United States, the, you know, like the, the, the best guys who he thinks are the best guys in the country. And mm. so... Um, I got cleared by all of them, and then even Dr. Maroon was still, I think, a little reluctant to do it because if something happens to me, regardless of whether it's concussion-related or not, yeah. it will all fall back on him, mm. right? Like, like, how did you clear this guy? It, they're not going to say, like, 
And if he says, well, the doctor at UCLA and the doctor at the Michigan and the doctor, uh, like all these other doctors clear him. No, no, you're the doctor who cleared him for WWE. Yeah. That's a lot of that's a lot of pressure. You yeah. know what I mean? And so I respect him a lot for, for being willing to make that change and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And and when did you find out you were officially cleared? Was Literally. It- so they announced it two, on a Tuesday yeah. at 3 p.m. Eastern time. I remember the day I, well. fa- I found out... 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday night. Really? So, yeah. Wow. And uh, apparently, even after that, it was kind of back and forth as far as whether they were going to do it. Wow. Even even after I'd gotten the thing that said, hey, you're cleared. So, what a whirlwind ride you've been Yeah. It's crazy <laughs> over the last few years. And how did that that kind of, the big announcement, your, the, the announcement that you were going to return in ring uh-huh. to, to Smacky D, how was that for you? Because I imagine that was a moment you'd kind of that had lived in your mind and you'd kind of played out in your mind a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, it's really strange because that day, you know, I go out there and I did the interview talking about having been cleared. Mm. And then that night I get beat up by Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. And I, I don't know if it came across on TV, but I felt like I was constantly trying to hold back smiling while I'm getting punched (laughs) in the face. (laughs) And it's just like, ah, ah, ah," you know? And like, so, but so, the yeah. energy you had in that angle, like we could all feel that even though you're being beaten up, you were yeah. kind of loving life in that yeah, moment. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, it's just crazy because uh, <clears throat> I've talked to Bree about this. So my home life right now is so good. Like uh, I love being home with my wife and my baby. And not that my home life before wasn't good. It just wasn't as awesome as it is now, <laughs> yeah. right? And so like my life was good. And then to be given back this thing that you love that was taken away, it like makes it, it – it's weird. It's it's like almost this insane sense of uh, gratitude and like, okay, nobody deserves like this amount of happiness, right? Mm-hmm. Like, okay, most people have parts of their life that aren't – even if you're you're really happy, you have parts you're like, ah, I don't, I don't like this, this part of it, right? Yeah. And you can always find something that you don't like. Oh, yeah. you know, I stubbed my toe or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> uh, but like – I go to work and I like my work. Mm. I go home and I love being at home. And it's this alternating things of like constantly going to these places and things that I love. And so that's really cool. You're a lucky man. Very lucky. That's great yes. stuff. And uh, like t- talking about being a dad, has that kind of changed your outlook on wrestling and how you are in ring? Because obviously your style is very hard hitting. Do you like? Do you have any trepidation when you go into the ring? Now I have no concerns when I go in the ring. Actually, the biggest uh, thing is that I don't want to be on the road as, okay. mu- as much. Yeah, you know, like um, that's one of the big things. Like they asked me about going to Saudi Arabia, like well before I was cleared. Like they just were like, "Hey, you know, we we're going we're going to Saudi Arabia. Do you want to go?" And I said, uh, "I don't know." They said, "You know." It'll be a good trip. It'll be this. It'll be that. I said, uh, okay. And then, um, and then when I got cleared, they asked me about the European trip, and I didn't realize they were back to back. And you know, you don't realize how long how long you're away mm. until you're away because we never had to think about it before. Like, yeah. okay, when I was gone before, or when Bree was gone before, I would miss her. But we can FaceTime and we can talk and it's, you know, it's nice. But when you're away from your baby, it's a completely different thing. And like it It hurts your heart. And like she in the so I will I will be home for like three days in the span of a month. Right. So like because it's 10 days, 10 days for the Saudi trip, 18 days here and only home three days. So that's 31 days that I'm home for three and a half days. A baby grows a lot in a month. And like she does things. She'll do things when I get back that she wasn't doing when I left. And like and some things that she was doing she'll no longer be doing. And that that kind of stuff makes me sad. So I've been talking to WWE about maybe doing a, a lighter schedule because when we when we first started talking about this, it wasn't like when um I sent the th- when Vince told me to send the letter to Dr. Maroon, he said for me to say for a limited schedule. Like protocol, uh, okay. re- revised concussion protocol for a limited schedule. Yeah. So they clear me, and then I'm just on everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting this. Yeah. How limited is this? <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, like when people had asked me before, what's your ideal schedule? And I like, 
anywhere between 50 and 100 matches a year to me is like because even um, one of the doctors that cleared me at Barrow's Neurological, um, Dr. Javier Cardenas, when he talked to me, he said like, I think when he had cleared me before in 2015, but he said with all the stuff that I've done on top of that, like I thought before we dotted our I's and crossed our T's. With the stuff that you've done on your own, you've really like scratched a big hole over the eye and really marked marked through the <laughs> T, you know. And so, uh, but he said, but just so you know, going forward, the the less exposure you have, and this is for anybody, whether you have a history of it or not, yeah, the the healthier you're going to be. So, like, I, I was thinking, like, oh, I'll do you know seventy five to one hundred matches a year, whatever it is, and and now it looks to be. To be way more than that. So yeah. if I were to change something, it would be like I, I'd kind of like to do do less, be away from home. Like for me, it's not wrestling less. It's more like I don't want to be away from home this much. This this trip especially has been hard for that. Yeah. Like watching watching Birdie as she like you now she's doing different things and missing her first birthday and missing Bree's second Mother's Day. And you always hear like dads talk about it, but until you do it you don't feel it yeah <laughs> so you just want to get that balance right yeah the, the yeah, life it, balance right. yeah it's all about trying to find the proper proper balance for yeah. it all and um just one more note about your injury and uh and Paige's recent injury did she have you spoken to her at all because she called you an inspiration during her retirement speech mm-hmm. have you had any conversations with Paige yeah I, I did I did talk to her and um our injuries are different but I I also believe that, like, okay, there's – I don't know if it's ruled out entirely. I don't know her situation very well, but it's, like, it's keeping a positive attitude. She mostly talked to me about – she told me that she was going to have to do the retirement speech. Um, this was WrestleMania Day. She did it the day after mm. WrestleMania, right? And she said – she would just ask me, how, how did you do it? And I said – I had to f- I had to focus on the things that were positive. Yeah. Because it's really hard and it's really emotional. You have to think for her like her family's. Like I I met her when she was like a kid. Like I was over here. I worked for her dad. You know what I mean? Oh, like did you I, work yeah, for the night? I yeah, yeah. That. I worked for her dad. I okay. wrestled her, I wrestled her brother, right? <laughs> like yeah, so like I met her when she was a kid. Yeah. And like um and so like she has strong ties to wrestling yeah. right she she doesn't know life without wrestling like yeah. i i think she was doing she was doing matches as a as a child well, right she, she she's told me her first bump was as a fetus yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so and so it's one of those things where the hardest part and when you're having to say goodbye to it is not being angry or bitter or sad or anything like that and i mean it's okay to be all of those things but that's how do you if this is your last time in front of this audience how do you want to present yourself mm. how do you want to how how do you want your overall look at wrestling to be yeah like i didn't want mine to be negative because even though i was feeling that at the time i didn't want i didn't want that to be how i presented my career yeah so. and and do you think based on because you had to go through that retirement speech and you know it was so emotional and the the wb24 documentary they did around you and just seeing those images of you and brie both in front of the crowd and backstage when you were really upset. Do you think it's all sort of happened for a reason? Because now you have have the, an, an even better connection with the crowd. They they are even more emotionally invested in, in you and your story. So I, I'm not somebody – so people ask me things like, oh – or they'll say things to me like, oh, everything happens for a reason mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And I don't believe that to be particularly true. I really? Be- I thought you'd be a big believer in something no, like no, no, that. No, no, no. And, and, he, and here's why. <clears throat> Because I don't deserve, there's no reason why I should have this kind of happiness and a child in a third world country should be starving to death. Mm. There is nothing that they've done to deserve that. They don't, like, uh, oh, what's the reason that's happening? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. That, oh, like, if there's a positive reason as to why that's happening, I, like... I can't name it. You mm. know what I mean? Like, I don't think that there's, oh, there's a reason for everything. Okay, then why are these, why are these children starving to death? Mm. Okay, why is there a massive extinction of species going on? Why are all these? And, okay, you have to understand that I believe that the world is getting better. Yep. But that doesn't mean that there's not bad things still going on. Yeah, of course. And so, like, I have a, I have a positive worldview. I have an optimistic worldview 
while still acknowledging that there's a lot of bad things going on. And because of that, whenever people say like, oh, things happen for a reason, like it really, it, it makes my heart hurt because what are you trying to say to these people who are going mm. through these horrible experiences? Like, like that, okay, if you have uh, three children, uh, or, so if you have six children and three of them have died from malnutrition, Tell me what's the reason behind that. Yeah. There's a reason. Oh, to make you stronger? What? No, screw off. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. no, there, there's, it's, I don't know. So, well, I regret saying that. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Helps at all. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that said, I do believe it's created a stronger, <laughs> yeah. a stronger yeah. connection between me and, and the WWE audience. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also given me a different perspective on wrestling in the sense of, now I just wrestle with a joy. That, yeah. Like, I've always loved wrestling. Like, loved it, loved it, loved it. But now I I wrestle with the, it's like you lost something and then you got it again. Yeah. And you have a new appreciation for being able to do it. Yeah. That you didn't have before. What a joyful place to be at. Um, and talking of joyful, uh, The Miz. Can I talk to you about The Miz? Um, what are your feelings on The Miz? Since you had that confrontation with him on Talking Smack, you mm-hmm. walked off the show. It seemed to get genuinely pretty heated. Mm-hmm. What's, uh, what's the story there? How, how, how would you describe The Miz to me? So uh, I would describe The Miz as somebody who doesn't know when to shut his mouth, right? Like um, who doesn't know when things get taken too far. And I can be accused of that same thing as well. If you look at that talking, I said some pretty derogatory things towards <laughs> you him. You did. And when, and when, so I was in the midst of this and I had two options. I'm either going to punch him in the face. And, and honestly, the reason he said those things, right, is because he, he knew that I wanted to quit. He knew that I wanted to leave and go do the independence if they weren't going to clear me. And I had said these things in interviews. Yeah. He said, hey, if you, really, if you really believe these things, then why don't you go do it? Yeah. And the thing is, is I asked for my release, and they wouldn't give it to me. And okay. it's like that there was also a rage there that it's like, I'm either going to punch this guy in the face or I'm going to walk off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, so – and the, but then therein lies the magic. I think with me and the Miz is because there is a very real tension and there's a very, you will see because you are going to interview him shortly after this. Yes. The difference in how he shows up here yep. and how I show up here. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'm not, and I'm not saying the way that he shows up is negative, Yeah. but we have completely opposite worldviews, yep. right? Completely opposite personalities. And, um, and so, because of that and because we've wor- worked in close conjunction for so long, there's, we know how to get e- under each other's skin in a way that, some, that is sometimes good. It's good for wrestling. Yep. And it's sometimes bad as far as like just having to be around each other. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, so with that said, um, you're both now on Smackers yep. together. WrestleMania 35. Surely there is a main event here that could happen you and the Miz and and keeping in mind this story dates back all the way to the original NXT mm-hmm. you were the Miz's rookie hilariously mm-hmm. yeah you know there is such an incre- potentially the greatest story WWE has ever told over a long period of time imagine that video package going into a main event match at WrestleMania is that something you're up for uh I am definitely up for it my question I you asked me that question I will answer it with a question Oh, do you trust WWE with telling that story from now until WrestleMania 35? <laughs> like, that, like, what in the last several years question. has has shown to you that something like that is possible here, and it for for it to be a, a, okay? I will I will reply to that that question. My answer is the last time they did that successfully over uh-huh. a long period of time was you in the build up to WrestleMania 30. Uh, right. So if you're involved, you're the key ingredient here. <laughs> yeah. Surely. If if something accidentally happens <laughs> and uh, Yeah, if they've got no control yeah, yeah, over yeah, it yeah. then if they've yeah, got they'll no do control well. over it, it's possible that it can happen. But uh but yeah, I you know like uh I I think that would be awesome. I think it would be something that the fans would be excited to see um whether or not we can prolong because people want to see me punch Miz in the face. Mm. I want to punch Miz in the face. 
whether we can prolong that on television for an, for that period of time, I don't know. Oh, I hope so. I yeah. hope so. <laughs> and well, let's talk just quickly about what you're doing at the moment in ring. A lot of people assumed you would kind of go straight to the title picture when you returned. You're in a feud with Big Cass at the moment. I've read a lot of negativity about the fact that you're in a feud with Cass and the work he's doing. I'm actually a big fan of what he's doing. I think mm-hmm. he's doing a great job. How do you feel about your you know position on the card and how you've kind of been bought? Back yeah, in? so it's it's weird because since I've come back, I I don't worry about it. Right. Okay. Like I said, there's there's a joy to me just being out there. Uh, it's interesting, though, too, because um, one of the producers who I very much respect had said to me uh, just a couple of days ago, he goes, you have to remember <clears throat> that you're Daniel Bryan and you need to treat yourself like you're Daniel Bryan as a po- meaning that like, hey, you're a top star here and you need to go in. And so one of the things is like, okay, if I see stuff on the show that I don't that I don't like, right? I I'll I'll be like, okay, for for me, for my stuff, hmm. I'll go in there and I'll say like, hey, I I don't like this because of this, this, and this. Here's my idea of how to fix it, how I think it's better. Yeah. And ninety five percent of the time, nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but but I don't. F- I'm not like, you need to do this or you need to do that or yeah. whatever it is. It's like, hey, this is my opinion from from my experience with within this business. And this is how I think this would work better, mm. uh, both for me and, and for who I'm working with. And um, and but I don't I don't fight for it because like I'm I'm happy to be back now. There has to be a transition. So Shawn Michaels um, once uh, showed me. He didn't. He told me, but he showed me. He said, "Look at John over there." John, he's talking about John Cena. He is constantly fighting every week to make sure that his segments are the best possible segments that they can be. Hmm. Right, and so like that's a fight that you have to fight every week, and I have to re get get back into that mindset of fighting for that. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm mentally at that place yet. Now yeah. I'm just mentally now I'm just mentally like <clears throat> grateful for being back. And I uh and I've had people say the thing to me about Big Cast, but I like you can't just rocket me straight into the title picture. Mm. And I think Big Cast is actually very very talented. Yeah. And so uh so yeah, I I'm not I'm not a, I'm not opposed to that or anything like that. I just and I also think sometimes I have the best fans in the world, but sometimes they they want something all all the time yeah. that WWE can't give them all the time, yeah. right? <laughs> and so it's like, and but I, I do want to say thank you guys for that because mm. that's why I got things like WrestleMania 30, right? Yeah. You know, it's like it like that sort of fan support and that sort of fan desire to see me at the best all the time like like that's what's made my career so i I, i'm very grateful for that but sometimes i worry that it's unreal they have unrealistic expectations on wwe as far as what they want from me um and you mentioned john cena just quickly how are things with john and nikki everything it's it's tough when things are played out in reality shows and yes. in the tabloids uh fans kind of don't know what's real and what's not yeah how are they both doing so uh I all I will say is that I uh it is not my place to talk about their relationship. Yeah. Because like I've had people say like, "Oh, I th- I think, you know, oh is it just for the show?" and I said, "No, it's definitely not for the show. This is a very real thing and it's very hard on both of them." Mm. And um but any sort of comments like I don't I don't necessarily if something were to happen with Bree and I, I don't I wouldn't want people very close to me saying, well, you know this. And it's like, like that's, it's their thing. Whatever they want to release to the public, they can do whatever yeah. they don't want to release to the public. That's not my place to say anything. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. And final, final question. Um, we've talked before about kind of your dream matches. If you were to ever return to the ring, uh-huh. you've mentioned a lot of opponents you would like to, to face in the future, but if you could choose only one, like big dream match, stipulation, location, and event. Who would it be? What, where, how, and why? Uh, so I think they've already announced where WrestleMania 35 is going to be. But if I can change that, 
<laughs> so uh, I would love to, if you're just talking one dream match, it would be Brock Lesnar, WrestleMania 35 in Seattle, Washington. Um, nice. Because that, I think, would be the the ultimate David Goliath underdog story. Yeah. Um, in front of like a hometown crowd that would be rabid for that. Yeah. And so, uh, so, th- so that would be, that would be my dream match. And even if it wasn't WrestleMania, if it was just in Seattle, it would be, it would be super cool. So any, uh, any stipulation, not that you need a stipulation, but no, I like, I, I like one of the things that, um, I like is just straight title matches. Like yeah. I love a straight title match feel. Like I love big, the, big fight a feel. Big fight feel yeah. that it feels like this is a championship match. Sometimes and I know that people like people like street fights and people like getting when wrestlers get hit with chairs or they chant we want tables or whatever it is. But those expectations come when you say this is a street fight yeah. or that sort of thing. When you just have a title match and there's no expectation for that and it just feels like, hey, these are two of the best guys in the sport and they are competing for the most prestigious championship in the sport, that is what – those are the things that drew me to wrestling, like the Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat stuff where yeah, it's just yeah. like you're watching it and you feel like these are the two best guys in the, in the sport and they're competing for the number one title, even when it was Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior, right? That had that feel of like mm. who's the best yep. guy between these two fighting over this championship. You know, like those are the things that I like when I was in Ring of Honor and that sort of thing. That's what I always strived for in my in my championship matches and that sort of thing so so yeah beast versus underdog at wrestlemania i yeah, love it for the title love it <laughs> daniel bryan as always an absolute pleasure yep thank you thanks so much. much man